This week, we're giving you tips on compositing and showing you how to choose the best camera angle to photograph your subject. All right, guys, welcome to Flurn Q&A. My name is Aaron Nace, and you can find me on flurn.com. This week, we've got tons of awesome questions. Now, if you have a question you want answered from me and the Flurn team, just leave it in the comments right down below. And don't forget, every person whose question we choose wins a free month of Flurn Pro. All right, guys, let's get into the questions. Hello, Flurn. Hello, Frederick. What's the difference between a smart object and a raster object, and what effect do they have on an image? I'm glad you asked. Smart objects are really incredible. Basically, a smart object creates a reference of a file. So instead of editing the file itself, you're creating a reference, which means it's non-destructive. Now, this comes in a few different advantages. First, when it comes to using filters, you can apply filters to smart objects and then change those filters at any point in time. For instance, if you blur a smart object, you can change that blur any time, even after you save that photo. You can also resize smart objects. So if you make them really, really small, you can size them back all the way to their original size and you won't lose any detail. Now, in contrast, when you're working with raster images, if you apply a blur, that blur is going to be stuck to the image. And if you make it really small and then try to resize it back to full size again, you're gonna lose a ton of information. Basically, if you know you're gonna be doing a lot of heavy editing to an object, it's a great idea to turn it into a smart object. You don't lose anything and you gain the ability to be able to adjust those changes at any point in time. It's important to note that when you create a smart object, it actually creates another reference file. So this can increase file size, but you can turn a smart object back into a raster object at any point in time. Simply right click and go to rasterize. How do I find the right angle to shoot at? I've been struggling with this for a long time and I still am. Thanks for your awesomeness. As with many things in photography, the angle that you shoot at is completely subjective and it's totally up to you. Now there are some things to keep in mind when photographing your subject that are going to impact how a viewer sees that person. For instance, if you photograph your subject from below, it's gonna make them look large and powerful and strong. So if that's what you're going for, photograph them from below. If you're photographing your subject from above, it tends to make them look smaller and weak. It's also gonna create a ton of distortion, making their head look large and their feet look small. If you're going for a more classic portrait, I highly suggest shooting at eye level. This will give the viewer the idea that they're on the same plane as the subject. And if the subject is on the left side of your frame, have them look to the right, which will create more space in your picture. If they're on the right side of the frame, have them look to the left and it's going to create more space. And whether you're photographing people or different objects, it's important that you know what the central subject is in that photograph and then base your composition around that subject. Keep in mind, they don't always have to be in the center. Oftentimes images are more interesting when your subject is slightly off center. If I discover a lone sausage on the street, should I take a gritty artsy photo or should I hand it to the police and it may be discarded as a murder weapon? Um, I, <laughs> that's gonna be my answer for that. <laughs> That's all I got. What are the best small budget lights according to you? In my opinion, the best lights you can get for the cheapest price tag are work lights from a hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever hardware store you have near you. These lights are incredibly cheap and they put out a ton of light, which is great. There are some drawbacks though. They tend to get really hot and they're really, really hard light sources, which means you're gonna need some diffusion. Now I suggest bouncing these into a wall and having the wall serve as your bounce or shooting through a five in one reflector. And you can check those out just click on your screen right now. Honestly, these work lights are really great if you're just starting to get into lighting because you can see the actual result right in front of you as compared to a strobe where you only see that result in the final photo. So if you're interested in working with different lighting setups, these work lights really are the way to go. Now I would go with two or three of them so you can kind of play with the distance between your subject, the amount of diffusion, how you bounce these lights and basically get an idea of how lighting setups work. These are super easy, they're plenty bright and honestly, light is light. Play around and have fun with your lighting. There's no such thing as correct lighting. You can do anything you want and that's why lighting is so fun. How do I make really good presets or actions that I can use on most of my photos? The ones that I create usually apply for a few of those, so I have to work on new ones again. You don't, you just buy them from Flurn. Bam! Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, but seriously, Lightroom presets and actions are not gonna be perfect on every single photograph because sometimes you have a light subject on a dark background, sometimes you have a dark subject on a light background and every photograph is different. So what I do is create multiple different variations of my presets so you have a bunch of different options. And don't forget to tweak your actions and presets after you've applied them. Just because something doesn't look perfect when you hit the button doesn't mean it's a throwaway. You can always go in there and change some settings and make it perfect for that photo. Hi, Aaron. Can you give us tips on outdoor photography? Please choose me, Daniel. 
I choose you. I cho cho choose you. And there's a picture of a train. So my first big tip when shooting outdoors is to shoot either during sunrise or during sunset, also known as golden hour. Now I'm sure you've heard of this, but it makes a huge difference in your photos. And here's why. The light from the sun during a sunrise or a sunset is a lot warmer than it is during the middle of the day, making for more compelling images. Not to mention the contrast between the sky and the ground is much lower, meaning you're not gonna have areas that are too light or too dark. So it's gonna fit within the dynamic range of your camera. Also light coming from the side of a person tends to be a lot more flattering than light coming right from above. You're gonna get what's known as raccoon eyes, which is just deep dark shadows under people's eyes when the sun is directly overhead. Next, it's important to note the differences between a hard light source and a soft light source. Now a hard light source is gonna create hard shadows and hard highlights that tends to not be flattering in pictures. And this is basically done on a bright sunny day. In comparison, a soft light source will create softer shadows and softer highlights, which is a lot more flattering. Basically, all you have to do to get a soft light source is shoot when there's a cloudy sky. If you have to shoot during the middle of the day and there are no clouds around, be sure to use a five in one reflector. These are relatively inexpensive and you can diffuse light doing the basically the same thing as clouds. You can also bounce and reflect light filling in the shadows. They help out a ton and they're super cheap. And my last tip for shooting outdoors is don't be afraid of the elements. Sometimes a little bit of rain or a little bit of snow can make for incredible photos. Just make sure to protect yourself and protect your camera and have fun shooting outdoors. What's the main difference between Camera Raw and Lightroom? So basically the photo editing tools within Camera Raw and Lightroom are the exact same. The main difference is that Lightroom also gives you the ability to catalog and organize your photos. When you're importing bunches of photos to your hard drive, Lightroom really helps out where to put those photos and gives you the tools you need to find those photos at any point in time. I primarily use Lightroom for cataloging and organizing my photos as well as doing some light editing. Now, when I need to do more advanced editing, I publish those out into Photoshop and then I go back into Lightroom where I export my images out for the web or for my clients. Hey Aaron, can a GoPro replace my DSLR? Honestly, no, a GoPro is not going to replace a DSLR and the camera on most modern smartphones are gonna be just as good if not better than what's on a GoPro. Now, the the beauty of the GoPro are the mounts that it comes with. So if you want to put it on a surfboard or in a car, then a GoPro is the way to go. If you're just looking for casual photos, I highly suggest just using your smartphone. And neither of these is going to replace a digital SLR, which will give you much more options, much more control over your camera, allow you to shoot with external lights, allow you the ability to have interchangeable lenses and have much better ISO performance. GoPros are really cool and they're great for action videos, but other than that, their uses are pretty limited in my opinion. What's the best way to go about blending your image Images when making a composite as far as color and lighting goes. So a composite photo is basically multiple different photographs that you put together to make it look like one photograph. And no matter how long you've been doing this, it is difficult. So if you guys are struggling, well, join the team. I have a hard time too, and I've been doing this for years. Now, here are a few suggestions that I find make this much easier. First, be sure to cut your subject out completely from their background. Second, convert your image into black and white. If you're just looking at your light levels, it's a lot easier to tell whether an image is too light or too dark. And then use clipping masks to either lighten or darken areas of your subject to help them blend into the new background. Keep in mind your white point and your dark point. The whitest point in your composite shouldn't be lighter than the rest of your image. Also, the darkest point shouldn't be darker than the rest of your image. You wanna make sure those match. Once your image looks great in black and white, it's time to turn it into color. Now it's time to use either curves or levels or color balance to adjust your colors to make them fit into the background. Also, it's a good idea to take some of the shadow colors from your image and apply those to the shadows on your composite. You can also take highlight colors and apply those to the highlights on your composite. Now keep in mind guys, compositing is really complex. So if you want more help, I highly suggest our tutorial, A Dark Force. It's over three hours long and we go over everything you need to know to create realistic composites. Good luck and have some fun because you can do anything in the world with composite photography. Last question. What color background do you suggest shooting a portrait on when you need to change out that background to another background in Photoshop? This is a great question. Honestly, you want to shoot with a background that's as close to the final background background as possible. For instance, if you're going to be putting someone in a snow scene where everything is very light, go ahead and shoot them on a white background. If you're going to be putting them into a dark alley with super gritty, make sure you photograph them on a dark background. If you have a very complicated subject with a lot of fine edges that you really need to cut out, 
that may be a good time to shoot on a green screen because you can select that green color and use it to cut your subject out. But other than that, you wanna match the background color as closely as you possibly can to the final background they're gonna be in. That way, if you don't make your mask absolutely perfect, things are just gonna blend in and look great. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Thank you so much to everyone who asked a question. And don't forget, if we answered your question, you win a free month of Flurn Pro. Just follow the link in the description and we'll send you your coupon code. And if you have a question for me and the Flurn team, just leave it in a comment right down below. We'd love to help you out. Thanks so much, guys. I'll Flurn you later. Bye, everyone. You have a 10? Is that all? Do you have a lot of money? No. <laughs> I have $12 on me. All right, let's go for it. Oh, <laughs> check out this dollars. I'm gonna need those back though, so. Okay. Aaron, that's my best money. <laughs>